welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Thursday, September the 17th, 2020. On this edition of The Politocrat, a conversation with Chuck Rocha, the president of Solidarity Strategies and the founder of Nuestro PAC, Chuck turns out the Latino vote like nobody does. And he did it this year for Bernie Sanders in Nevada in the presidential primary earlier in the year. It was a spectacular result with 70% of Latino voters voting for Bernie Sanders due to the hard work and efforts and strategy of Chuck Rocha and his team. A conversation with Chuck coming up Next. So I have the real honor of uh, having my next guest on. His name is Chuck Rocha. He is the president of Solidarity Strategies. He's the founder of Nuestro PAC. It's a PAC that's dedicated to turning out Latino voters in large numbers, not just in this election, but elections going forward beyond that. He is the mastermind and strategist behind the very successful turnout of Latino voters in Nevada in the presidential primary for Bernie Sanders earlier this year. Over 70 percent of Latino voters went for Bernie, due in no small part to the efforts of Chuck Rocha and his team. He's written a book about this called T.O. Bernie, T.I.O. BernieBook.com is the website to get that book from. And he is here to talk to us about a number of things in the next few minutes, and he can be found on Twitter at Chuck, R-O-C-H-A. I call him the hardest working man in the voter turnout business. (laughs) I want to offer a very warm welcome to you, sir, Mr. Chuck Rocha. Oh my God, thank you so much. That's such a nice introduction, and it's my pleasure to be here. And thank you for the work that you're doing in spreading the message. Thank you, thank you. Um, One of the things that's very important um, to start out with, Chuck, is and people have to keep understanding this because I don't think enough people do. The Latino community is not a monolith. That's number one. Number two, there are so many issues that affect the community. And I think it's also important to point out and to ask you, um, what is it that you when you have these conversations, how do you like to have them? Because there's terms like Hispanic, and personally, I don't like that term personally. Um, there's terms like Latino, Latinx. How do you want to have that conversation today in the few minutes that we have? You know, I really do appreciate you asking because it is just like one of those things that I find myself as a Latino toiling with myself because we have all of these terms that have been forced on us through genocide through colonization through lots of different things that are depending on where you're from and the latino community to your point which is an excellent one is we come from latin america we come from non-latin americas we come from europe we come from island nations we come from lots of different places and my even myself i self-identify as latino um and I don't like Hispanic as well. I don't like any word that refers to me that has the word panic in it, to be honest. And I want to make sure that <laughs> I uh, use proper Latin. But, you know, it, there's no real term. But I just normally, however I can hear somebody self-identify, even the Latinx, which, uh, you know, I understand not gender specific. I understand all of those things. But if that's the way you choose to self-identify yourself, what I normally do is out of courtesy, I return that to self-identify you in that way. But uh, for this conversation, Latino is fine. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. That's really important. Um, so, look, I mean, I have expressed this and I don't know that I really want to spend a whole lot of time in the time that we have saying this, but I do want to put this on record uh, that I have been nervous about the way and we'll get to your work more importantly in a few moments. But I have been very nervous, admittedly, about the way the DNC and and this current campaign have been going about uh, so far, trying to reach out to the Latino contingent. Um, there are some, we're seeing some changes to that slowly. Um, but before we get into the great work that you do, do you care to talk about any of that? Because I, I feel that the community has been marginalized a lot. And people tend to, when they talk about the Latino community, whether it's in the media, whether it's in even the Democratic Party, 
is always targeted at immigration. And there are so many issues, as I said earlier, agriculture, um, family, so many other things um, that the Latino community care about, and not just immigration. Do you want to talk about any of that with the DNC or any of that? Or do you want to just move on to some of the work that you're doing? Because I think it's very important to talk about. I think that the work that I'm doing is going to lead into talking about making up for mistakes that have been made historically over a long period of time. I think what puts me in a unique position to talk about both is that I'm the most senior Latino strategist probably in the country, not based off of how great I am, because I am not that good. I'm just old. So I've been doing it for a long time. So I've seen a lot of mistakes. When I go into a campaign, what makes me a horrible consultant is I am really apt to tell the truth all the time, whether you like it or not. And most consultants will lie to you just to get your money. And so telling the truth is that uh, Latinos don't just care about immigration. They're not just from Mexico. We're not a GOTV universe. That means you don't just show up and ask us to vote at the last minute, we're all going to show up to vote for Democrats, is that we need to change the way that we do our work and change it through the work that I'm currently doing. And that's literally the reason I wrote the book, T.O. Bernie, was to show all the other consultants and people out there, A, to put you in the room in the senior positions in Bernie Sanders' campaign, but then also to let people know the right way, in my opinion, which was borne out in our results with Bernie Sanders, that if you spend money on black or brown voters, the same way you spend money on white voters, you would get a much better turnout and you would end up building a larger, long-term progressive base that would help you dominate your political sector for years to come if you were to be smart enough to make that initial investment. And and to that end, you put out, uh, you tweeted this out on your Twitter handle a number of times, this astonishing graph that shows the kinds of monies that these political action committees are spending that are going to more the white uh, white uh, organizers and strategists or and people of that universe versus the kinds of uh, monies that are being spent right now um, among some of the political uh, communities uh, in the Latino community because of this grave disparity and where a lot of that money is going. I think that's what you may be pointing to, correct? Yes, yes. And I think that uh, I keep putting that graph up. And the graph I should explain to your listeners is that the top 10 uh, non-Latino and non-black super PACs, which means that their main focus is talking to white persuadable voters, some around women's issues, some around the environment, lots around just pure electoral politics, just the top 10. Uh, super PACs in America that are Democratic have, as of 731, had raised $500 million. And up until that same point, same reporting, same open public, this is nothing I'm making up. You can get it off of the Federal Election Commission website, which where I went and did this research to make the graph. There are three leading super PACs, and in full disclosure, I run the largest one called New Estro PAC. Those three PACs over the same time period have only raised five million dollars so the outside organizations and donors have given 500 million dollars to go persuade and turn out white voters while latino groups have just been given five million and then people want to turn and look at me and say chuck why does latino voters don't show up at the same rate that white voters do and i just scratch my head and shake it like you're doing right now and be like well i'm just an old mexican redneck from east texas but i figure if you spend 500 million dollars on somebody and then you turn around and just spend a couple pennies on the others. You can see why one group overperforms the other. Well said. Uh, it's, it, 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 this, it's like fuzzy math. You know, do your math. You know, it makes sense. Oh, dearie me. And, that, and that's the thing, um, because I do want to get to the work that you're doing um, and Nuestro Pack is doing. You put out a brand new ad. Oh, my gosh. Um, this is good ad, and there's going to be the first of many. Um, we have early voting going on in all these states, and you're doing incredible things with mailing. Can you talk a little bit about the, the efforts that your PAC is doing right now, Chuck? So we have to – it's just different for black and brown folks. We've got to get up earlier. We've got a lot – work longer and I have to be smarter than the others because as I just mentioned I have less money to work with so I have to be very strategic and very persuasive with the little bit of money I have so it takes more strategy on my end because I don't have any money to waste so I've sat back and watched what Joe Biden and the Democrats are doing I've seen where they're working at I watch the media buys and then I strategically make a decision in my mind of what I don't think is happening early on he wasn't doing Spanish 
to match Donald Trump's Spanish TV ads. So I went up early with TV ads in Arizona, North Carolina. And then as we went through the late summer, now early fall, I noticed that none of the Latinos in the battleground states were getting mail in Spanish and English from the Biden campaign. So as you saw, last Monday, I announced the largest mail drop by an outside organization in the history of American politics was dropping three million pieces of mail. That's seven different pieces over four weeks, like bang, 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 all during your point, early vote. So they're getting information about Joe Biden, so they'll show up and vote for him and feel confident they know what his issues are if their campaign hadn't done it and they hadn't done it yet, so I'm doing it for them more or less without coordinating with them. And then the last thing is the ad, and I would call it a historic ad. I would call it a groundbreaking ad. Nobody's ever made a three-minute long TV commercial. I'm literally telling a short story about how great Joe Biden is in Spanish and English overlaid with this beautiful song by this local Mexican band in Los Angeles to kind of wrap the community together to be our closing ad. Most people make a closing ad the final days of the election. Well, me and you both know that there's been so much early vote and vote by mail that, that the election's already over. 60% of people already voted. So I started my closing ad at the beginning of early vote and vote by mail, which is just smart strategy and doing things outside of the box with this very moving rendition of visually uh, 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 visually moving things that you see in the ad that I'm trying to bring to life in my old Mexican redneck voice. But you really need to go to at Chuck Rocha or at Nuestro Pack and look at this video because my words will never do the justice of probably the most highly produced TV ad we've ever made. Now that sounds really exciting and I urge all listeners to do that. I'll be putting links in the episode here to that so that people do click on it and take a look and go to... uh, Chuck's Twitter handle or and Nuestro Pack as well. Um, just a couple of last couple of things here while I have you. Um, one of the things that either that I that I do think is very very critical is to look at all of these other issues uh, as you've pointed out, not just the one issue. I mean, brown lives matter, black lives matter, and there's been a lot of focus, understandably, on black lives matter, brown lives matter as well, and and I think one of the things that nobody's been talking about really in the last couple of months is Vanessa Guillen and the other at least 12 or 13 Latino or Latinx individuals who have been killed on or around Fort Hood in Texas, in your home state. And this year alone, this year alone. Um, and I don't know if you if you were aware of that. And I don't know how much you want to say about that. But for my listeners, uh, I, that's another issue. Since we've been talking a lot about the military, we've heard a lot about what the person in the White House has been saying about military. I, I wonder if that's something that Joe Biden would do, if you think he should do it. What are your thoughts about any of this Uh, at all. Um, It's a bit different from uh, what we're talking about, but it's also, I think, quite important. I think uh, you're raising an important point, and I grew up just about an hour and 40 minutes from Fort Hood, where this catastrophe happened in Waco, Texas, with this young Latina, that I think that the, uh, hopefully, thank God, hopefully, that the investigation shows what went on there. Uh, I think me and you both know that in the black and brown community, in lots of neighborhoods and lots of places, we live with a different anxiety today, whether we're worried about getting, we've always worried, let's be clear, I've never, I've, since I was a little boy and I'm, I've been beat up by the cops, I understand what it's like to deal with racism and deal with police brutality. It's just now that everybody's got an iPhone, it's being uh, put out to the general population, which is starting to bother woke white women, which now thinks that maybe something actually can get done because we've all known about this for years. But to your point, I want to connect it to the election. And I think that if you talk about the turmoil of watching a policeman literally kill a black man in Minnesota and or shoot a black man in the back or kill a Latina on an army base, and then you add in the coronavirus, which is over-indexing in our communities and killing our people, being non-white people at a higher rate, Black and brown babies are eight times more likely to catch this disease than a white baby. There's a reason why that. There's a reason why a black woman is six times more higher to be die in childbirth than a white woman. Like there's all these statistics that just bear out the proof that it's different. Well, you, you, you couple all this anxiety with a disease and with racial turmoil with an idiot in the White House who is a, just a blatant racist to the most whatever your definition of that is, he don't like black and brown people, bottom line. And so it, 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 
it gives us a reason why we must mobilize our communities to show up and vote. Now, is every politician going to fix everything? No. Is electing a black man or a black woman or a brown man or a black brown woman going to fix everything? No, not even. There's black and brown politicians that are wrong on working class issues. But it gives us better hope. I tell people all the time that I don't agree with Joe Biden on, you know, 20 or 30 percent of what he stands for. But that means I do agree with 60 or 70 percent. And I know I have much more of a chance to persuade him to be closer to where I align morally than where I would ever be trying to get Donald Trump to move to. So sometimes we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. And I know people have said, well, Chuck, we've been having to just get by with good for a long time. Well, I would push back and say, I would say, no, we've just been trying to be okay with okay. I need something now a little better than okay, and I need good. And I think that Kamala Harris, being a child of an immigrant, multiracial family, I think if they were to put black and brown people in their cabinet, I think if they would appoint black and brown judges, I think if we all of these things would move towards gradually turning this big ship towards a righteous path that would give more of us a voice, I really believe. One last thing, your, uh, your advice uh, and what you'd like to close out with here, obviously... Um, uh, what you're saying is something that we all must hear and act upon and be educated about. What would your advice be for any voter, but particularly for, for the Latino community in terms of voting and everything else right now? What, what would your words, what, what would you want to say? I would want to say that uh, I've been inspired this year. I got to be a senior advisor for Bernie. I got to write this book. I got to create the new Astro Pack. I've got to live the American dream. And you should know for your listeners that if you read my book, you'll find out some things that you don't know. You'll find out that I never went to college. You'll find out that I had a baby when I was a baby like my mother did with me when I was 19. You'll find out that I'm a convicted nonviolent felon. Uh, you'll find out that uh, I have bounced in bars and I've lived the real life of any individual out there. And it's important for me to tell your listeners that because if I can do it, and I can then run a presidential campaign, live in this big house in Washington, D.C., and get to do and see my own privilege, then you can do that. And don't let mistakes that you think you have made that may ruin your life, don't think because you got bad credit, don't think because you've got a criminal record like I, I do, that you can accomplish, because this is the greatest country in the world, and it's up to us to make it what it is. I've got to live that dream. I've, I've got to live that life of redemption. And that's why I wrote this book, so every other poor black and brown kid who thinks that they didn't go to the best school or that they made a, a maybe made a mistake in their past with a criminal record that they can't overcome that. And I wanted to show them that if my dumb ass could do it, anybody could. <laughs> Thank you so very much for your time, Chuck. We really appreciate what you bring to the table. The hardest working man in the voter turnout business, Mr. Chuck Rocha. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thanks to you and your listeners. Y'all have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. That was Chuck Rocha, and he is the president of Solidarity Strategies, the founder of Nuestro PAC, and he has written a book about his efforts for the Bernie Sanders campaign, what he did in Nevada this year, and 70% of Latino voters came out and voted for Bernie using the great strategy of Mr. Chuck Rocha. His book, again, is called T.O. Bernie. That's T-I-O Bernie, and it can be purchased at toburniebook.com. And again, Chuck Rocha can be found on Twitter at Chuck, R-O-C-H-A. And Nuestro Pack is also on Twitter at N-U-E-S-T-R-O-P-A-C. I want to thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. Hello again, it's Omar. I'm back. <laughs> the podcast episode is not quite over yet because, as I have alluded to in numerous occasions, uh, in numerous fora, I am giving away books over the next few days on this podcast. And this is the first giveaway. And all you have to do is go to Twitter at the popcorn R E E L. Send me a tweet saying that you would like a copy of this particular book that I'm about to mention, because it's only one book um, 
one copy of that book only and one time only for this particular book. I will be doing more giveaways over the next few episodes. So listen to the episode because you never know where I'm going to drop this giveaway. So I'm thankful for you listening to this podcast. And for those of you who listen to every episode, thank you so much for that. So this giveaway of this book on this day is specifically for um, the Thursday, September 17th episode only. So if I do not hear from anybody in the next, well, 24 hours, when by the time Friday rolls around, (laughs) when Friday at midnight Pacific time rolls around, then this giveaway will be null and void. So this has to be acted upon first come, first serve, one copy of this particular book. And it is Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own by Eddie Gloud Jr. Eddie Gloud is a professor and um, is a distinguished professor and has been on television on a number of occasions, most notably on MSNBC, and he is an historian as well. This is a great book that he has written called Begin Again. It's about James Baldwin and how he saw America and how we need to now learn about America today through the eyes of James Baldwin and his perspectives. And I'm a big fan of James Baldwin, always have been. I've talked about him a lot on this podcast. So all you need to do, if you are listening to this podcast right now, and it's got to be only for September the 17th, 2020, is to go to Twitter at the popcorn R-E-E-L and just send me a tweet saying that you would like to receive a copy of Begin Again by Eddie Gloud. And again, this is only for Thursday the 17th of September. Any tweets that I get after midnight on Friday, September the 18th, 2020 will be null and void. So you have up until midnight tonight at midnight Pacific time. That's Friday the 18th of September at midnight is the latest that you can tweet me that you would like a copy of this book begin again. After that, Any entry is null and void and the giveaway is no longer in effect for this particular book. I am at the popcorn R-E-E-L. And don't forget, there are other book giveaways that I'll be doing over the next few episodes. So stay tuned. And uh, you never know when I'm going to give the book away. And it may be anywhere in the episode. So make sure you listen over these next few episodes for more book giveaways. Thank you very much.